Welcome to Hedge Fund Tips with Tom Hayes. I'm Tom Hayes, and this is your 134th video cast, 124th podcast for the week ending May 12th, 2022. So we're going to kick it off with media. And first, I'd like to thank Liz Clayman and Ellie Terrett for having me on Fox Business, the Clayman Countdown this afternoon uh, to talk about the market was Dow was down 561, uh, etc. And what Liz was asking about was uh, the crypto winter with uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum selling off, etc. And the impact on the overall market. And what I shared with her was that um, it's probably not as much a crypto winter as it is a margin winter. Uh, and that means basically as the 10-year yield skyrocketed from 137 basis points uh, in December, can you imagine it was it was 1.37 percent just uh, five or six months ago, and uh, peaked at 319 uh, this week earlier this week? Uh, in that period, money's come out of crypto, it's come out of innovation stocks, it's come out of tech stocks, it's come out of biotech stocks, it's come out of China tech, and recently it's come out of everything under the sun that hasn't been nailed down. Uh, correlations have gone to one. It's a forced liquidation. And it's just got to clear through the system. It's basically where we're at now. Don't try to look at companies and say, you know, uh, do valuation. At this point, it's just structural, dislocative, and that's where huge opportunities show up. Now, this is due to, one, the higher cost of margin. Two, uh, margin calls for long duration speculative assets as they decline in price. You know, you've got your Beyond Meats, your Pelotons, your Teledocs, your uh, all these companies that have gone from, you know, 100 times sales to 50 times sales and they just keep going lower and lower and margin calls. So it's a cascade to wash out all that retail money, then wash out the funds that are exposed to those type of things uh, and deal with uh, their uh, fund closures, etc. And then we can find a base and uh, we'll rock it up to intrinsic value and beyond. Um, so that's number three. And then as yields stabilize, and now today they got down to 282, this was a key point I made about two weeks ago in one of our articles. I wrote, um, if you want to know when value tech, China tech, and biotech are going to go up, uh, just let me know when yields stabilize and they stop going up. Uh, and that's when you'll start to find a bid for those stocks and you'll find a material bid for those stocks because they can perform exceptionally well, even with a 3% tenure, uh, which um, is low by historic standards, number one. Number two, we peaked out at 325 in October of 2018 during a tightening cycle. Uh, tech was doing just fine, um, biotech, etc., and uh, we peaked out at 303 in January of 2014, uh, another tightening cycle. And all of them did well uh, after you got the, the tightening fears out of the way with the first hike or two hikes. And then they took off. So I didn't, wasn't able to cover all of this on the segment with Liz. So I'm going to share it with you. Um, but... Uh, once we see that stabilization, we're going to see stabilization in the groups with particular emphasis on biotech. And I, I wanted to talk about the 2015 to 2016 biotech pattern uh, looks exactly like what we're seeing now. The XBI biotech ETF, um, uh, it fell 50%, over 50% in anticipation of rate hikes uh, that were coming in, in, uh, in 2016. And from early 2016 to 2018, the Fed rose, uh, raised the Fed funds rate from 25 basis points to 225 basis points and started quantitative tightening, uh, rolling off the balance sheet, just like we're doing now. We've already had the two hikes. The biotech sector, after collapsing 50 plus percent uh, in 2015 to early 2016, just like we've collapsed. 60% from uh, 2021 to early 2022 on the XBI. After that second hike, it found its bottom in 2016 and rallied 140% over the next two years while the Fed's fund rate was going from two, uh, 25 basis points to 225 and while uh, they were starting quantitative tightening. So we think we could be in for a similar pattern. And today was very interesting because Keep in mind, the 10-year yield peaked just a couple of days ago at 319 in the morning. It's down to 282. 
And two out of the last four days, XBI Biotech has been the top performing sector on the day. Uh, and we're starting to see a lot of the stuff that got sold off on interest rate and inflation fears now start to get bid while other things that were inflation hedges start to get sold off. So sometimes it takes a few weeks longer than expected is an understatement. But uh, if the thesis is intact, you just got to hold tight. And uh, and then sure enough, things start to move in your direction. And then everyone says, well, you know, what a genius, blah, blah, blah. You know, but, you know, you're you're early sometimes on these things and if you can just hold through you get paid hugely over time and that's the name of the game is time arbitrage so um the other thing i wanted to talk about which is a critical catalyst this week is one of the two uh, points of my biotech thesis for those of you who've been listening has been m a my thesis has been uh the healthcare sector russell 3000 has 400 billion dollars of cash on the balance sheet big pharma has record cash on the balance sheet, but they've got patent cliffs coming up. Uh, so they're gonna have to buy their innovation. And if there was ever a time to buy innovation, it's right now when biotech is trading at the lowest multiples across the spectrum from price to book, price to sales, uh, price to uh, operating cash flow, price to forward PE, uh, uh, price to forward earnings, forward PE rather. Uh, on all the metrics, it's cheap. So all that needed to happen was one player stepped out to ignite animal spirits. And that happened this week with Pfizer buying Biohaven for $11.6 billion. It put every big pharma board in America on alert. If you're not in the market buying these cheap companies, your competition is. And if you don't get off your, your duff and do something, you're gonna get left in the dust. And you're gonna see more and more of these deals these takeouts start to happen, then managers are gonna to start to pay attention to the sector. They're gonna to wanna to get exposure. And just like the cycle is negative on the downside, every day is bad news. When more and more of these deals start happening, it's gonna be positive on the upside. And then boom, June, you get the P PDUFA, you'll get a couple positive drugs and boom, we'll be off to the races in the face of a tightening cycle, which everyone says it doesn't happen, except for the fact that the biggest rallies in biotech can happen during tightening cycles. So um, when you burden yourself with the facts, great things happen. So um, finally, I wanted to talk about inflation. Uh, rate stabilization will be a function of inflation expectations. PPI and CPI peaked last month as this week's reads were in fact lower, okay? Now, depending which headline you read, um, the CPI came in slightly worse than expected. However, it was lower than last month. So we did hit a peak. Whether we get follow through in May or not, we're going to find out. But I, I have strong confidence we will. And I'm going to tell you why in just a second. PPI did come in lower than expectations and came in lower than last month. So there's certainly a peak there. And we think we're going to get follow through there. Why is that? Because if you look at the CPI all the way through last year, you're going to see the biggest jump was in the month of May. So the comps are gonna be much higher for May than they were for April. April, it was just taking off. Now those comps are gonna kick in and year on year, these numbers are gonna collapse. Uh, and then maybe you get a, you know, a, a lucky break with oil or something like that. But irrespective of that, uh, the comps are moving up so that that peak is gonna hold in place and that uh, it's gonna, the bell curve is really gonna to start to, to roll over and show us some positive things. Um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about was earnings mul multiples. So, and by the way, when I talk about year on year, that's the base effects that everyone's talking about. Uh, that base has got went much higher because you had a huge spike in May. So that next print is going to look really good compared to 8.3%. I'd say probably six or four. I mean, we'll see what estimates are. Um, and uh, and finally, earnings and multiples. This is a key key critical point that I that I you know kind of went through in the article of the week, which was that the five year average multiple on the S and P 500, which includes the last tightening cycle, by the way, when the Fed fund rate was over two percent, and quantitative tightening through that period with rates much higher, the average multiple was still 18.6 times. Well, if you look at this this year's earnings at 220, just about 229, they took a dollar off last week. Uh, and 2023, 
The S&P traded today down to 17 times current year earnings and 15 and a half times next year's earnings. So that's a big deal. 15 and a half times next year's earnings with a Fed's fund rate at 75 bips and a 10-year yield at 282, uh, that is excessively low. And for everyone that's calling for uh, um, uh, that this is that this is uh, the 2020 tech wreck again, I got news for you. Uh, there are a lot of differences. And Jim Paulson put out a good article. Number one, number two, you just have to al almost dismiss that because generals always fight the last war, and it's never that. So our last crisis was housing. So everyone's been calling for a housing crisis for the last 12 years. Uh, and of course, that never happens. Uh, you know, you had the SNL crisis in the 90s. Uh, and 10 years later, they were calling for another SNL crisis. But it wasn't that. It was tech. And then 10 years later, it was mortgages. And then 10 years later, maybe it'll be something else. But um, the fact of the matter is, not only were valuations meaningfully higher on every metric in uh, 20, uh, in 2000, and most companies weren't earning money, uh, uh, but furthermore, the 10-year yield topped out at 6.8%. Money had a significant cost. Right now, you are, lo you are still losing money in real terms by not borrowing today. And that's what po most people are missing. If you have 8% inflation, and let's say it goes down to 4% by the end of the year or 3%, um, and you can still borrow for 10 years, I, I mean, you're not the US government, but you could still borrow at 4 or 5%, uh, et cetera, it's costing you money not to have leverage, not to have, not to have borrowing. So uh, money is still free in real terms, and that's accommodative, that is highly stimulative. And I do believe that it's going to stay that way in real terms because as you look at every cycle, the terminal rate where the Fed stops raising is always con you know, consistently been lower. Uh, so it was 225 plus. I, you know, I would be surprised if we hit 175 to two. And what's the two, what, what did the 10 year, what did the two year yield get up to this week? It was at 271 and change or, or, or even higher. Uh, that's probably got 100 basis points more priced in than is actually going to happen. And the second you see another print of CPI dropping next month due to high base effects, you're going to see the Fed come out and do their dovish pivot. There's no question in my mind that's going to happen because they want a soft landing uh, and they're certainly going to get it. So, so you just have to burden yourself with the facts. Money was not free in 2000. Money is still free today. Uh, the multiples at, at with the, you know, either rates have to go up another 300 basis points or earnings have to come down another 20, 30 percent to justify the indices at these prices. So you tell me which one it's going to be. And if it's going to be neither, then there are bargains to be had in this market. And uh, and we believe that 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 to be the case in, in selective areas that, that we've talked about. So. Um, the other positive is that um, bonds finally started to get bid this week, which we've covered and, and we'll go into further detail. So uh, anyway, with that said, uh, it was great to be on with Liz as always, thanks to Ellie Terrett and uh, moving right along, want to draw your attention to um, a podcast that I did um, with, it's called the uh, East West Investment Opportunities. And the host is from Germany. His name is Marcel Munch. And I'll just pull up his channel here because this thing went viral over the weekend. And we went into a lot of detail on. Um, we went into a lot of detail on biotech, China tech in particular, uh, and the overall market. And this one, uh, you know, just basically went viral over the weekend. You know, 156 comments, 9,500 views so far. It's a 30 minute watch. If you want the latest thoughts on biotech, uh, China tech and the overall market, it's, it's definitely worth a, a look. So thanks to Marcel for having me on that. Um, uh, 
and you'll see him uh, just here's his channel East West Investment Opportunities and then you can find his uh, Twitter in the show notes right here Marcel M-U-N-C-H with two dots over the U and that's his Twitter so uh, thanks for having me on that was really great uh, also want to thank Sagarika uh, Jaisingani for including me in her article on Bloomberg um, and this was about uh, the CPI print. I said the market won't like it initially, but it came into the print very weak and we may see some buyers step in over the next 48 hours. And we did see some buyers step in at the end of the day today uh, with biotech up huge uh, relative to the rest of the market was the top performer. Also, retail was up because there are rumors. I think it was uh, Coach was up um or one of those kate spade or coach some handbag company because there are rumors that shanghai is going to reopen in june which could be monstrous and by the way the k-web was up today so it was opposite day <laughs> all of our stuff was actually green uh which was a nice uh thing but why was it green it was green because look at the 10-year yield we've been talking about this for three months we thought that uh bonds were hitting a bottom yields were hitting a top uh, we think that may be the case. They've, they've, they've popped off pretty quick off that 319 down to 282 and all the stuff, all of a sudden, all of our stuff is getting bid all at once. It's a positive step in the right direction. Uh, and, um, and we look forward to more to come. Want to thank Ellen Chang, who did an amazing article on biotech in the street.com. She used a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about in terms of, um, is, you know, uh, companies trading at a discount uh to the cash on the balance sheet and we're going to go into some nuance on that uh a viewer named adam dyer who's a, a junior investment banker uh pulled together a whole spreadsheet for me did an incredible job with it to get us like precise data not just you know taking what what we're what we see in the articles etc and we'll go into that but um what you can see here is that the numbers of nasdaq biotech members trading for less than cash has surged so they're talking here uh about 20 percent of the uh 37 members are trading for less than cash it's it's their enterprise value where they back out the cash the cash is greater than enterprise value and um adam did a did a comprehensive thing that we'll look at but basically the key here is not the scalpel the key is the crayon to get the concept and what you can see here from the concept is that every time you've had these spikes in, com in the percentage of companies trading at a discount to cash, and this has been the biggest spike of all in history, uh, you were at a bottom, not a top. Now, this is a monthly chart, folks. So we're, you know, we're two months into this hell, like trying to pick the bottom here and it'll bounce up five and 10 percent and down five and 10 percent. But look here at these bottoms. They take quite a few months to bounce, but then you're up 140% over the next uh, you know, few years. Here, again, so 2019, 2020, bottom, you were up huge over the next two years. 2016, here we go. This was the beginning of the tightening cycle. Remember, XBI was up 140% over the next two years. Crashed on fears of tightening, crashed on fears of tightening and then took off after the first couple of hikes. We've just had a couple of hikes. Uh, 2012, boom, another short-term bottom before one of the biggest rallies in history. Uh, 2008 and nine, look, this took about six months to build a bottom and then it made new highs less than a year and a half later. Okay, new highs, you know, you'd have trouble getting through to my phone. I'd be on my yacht, uh, I'd still pick it up. I'd probably have, you know, four Bloomberg terminals in the yacht, but. Uh, you know, th these things. And then again, in 2002, you had a spike. And what happened? Monster rally over 100% in a year and a half. So uh, this doesn't guarantee it's going to happen this time. But, you know, like I said, if you don't bet when the odds are in your favor, you're never going to win. And you just have to, you know, you don't go all in on any one thing. You don't go all in full, full tilt leverage on any one thing. But when the odds are really favoring you, you got to make, you know, put enough chips in to make it matter and then just suck it up in the short term until it builds this base. Sometimes it took, you know, three, four months to build the base. Sometimes it took a half a year. But sure enough, they all made it back to new highs every single time. 
And that would just be an unbelievably monster of all monster trades uh, in a career. So read Ellen Chang's article. I think it's phenomenal. She's done three great articles on this group. And uh, you can find her over at the street. Next, uh, Bansari Kamdar. I want to thank her for including me in her article today in Reuters. <laughs> this one was about Beyond Meat. And she called me about Beyond Meat like right around the opening when like the last thing I wanted to think about was Beyond Meat. Uh, but I love talking to Bansari and I'm so grateful she calls when, when, she, uh, when she needs a quote. So um, basically Beyond Meat was down like, I don't know, 20%. I guess they, you know, S the bed for earnings or some, some ridiculous thing. I, I don't know much about Beyond Meat because I don't like to eat shoe leather. But leaving that aside... Um, and then I guess it rebounded when she called. She's like, wow, it was down 20%. Now it's up, uh, um, you know, it's green. And I said, you know, I said, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, that's not, so, you know, it's not really something that I would touch or be interested in. But the thing is down 87%. It's got $700 million of cash. It's not going bankrupt. That's probably why some people are stepping in. <laughs> so the quote looks like, you know, I'm interested in stepping in, but it, 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 it's immaterial. Everyone that listens to this know that I, I wouldn't touch it at a 10 foot pole. But, you know, may, maybe at some price uh, if, if earnings start to accelerate. But um, I thought that was kind of funny. But uh, all of those type stocks are starting to get bid because yields have come in and uh, uh, people can take more risk. And I think that's going to be unbelievably exciting for biotech, for uh, China tech. And if the shoe leather companies uh, on a ha on a hamburger bun benefit as a result of that. Godspeed, <laughs> you know. Cheers, cheers to uh, uh, eating vegetable burgers. So moving right along, um, want to thank Medicine and Anisha Sirkar for including me in their article. Uh, I guess this was on a down day. A firm was down fifteen percent, or uh, as upstarts. Uh, Upstart uh, had terrible earnings. A firm, I think, did well today after the bell. But I said, if companies are not profitable and not generating cash flow in a rising rate environment and uh, a draining liquidity environment, many investors can't justify owning them, said Tom Hayes. And that's just the name of the game. I mean, it, and we've gone into the nuance of why a basket of biotech makes sense, uh, even if they're not cash generative, because it's a different game. There's no catalyst for these pandemic darlings like Zoom and Teladoc and uh, Beyond Meat and et cetera, et cetera, for their revenue to go up 10x in the next 12 months. But if you buy a basket of biotech, you know some percentage of them are going to get drugs approved, go up 10, you know, 10x, uh, get taken out, go up two or three x. Uh, and and if you have a big enough basket, the action happens for 30 to 40 percent on takeouts and or drug approvals. The sector's up 100, 150% over a couple of years, and you're making bank. And that's what we try to do. So, um, Seth Klarman. It turns out, quote of the week, it turns out that value investing is something in your blood. There are people who just don't have the patience or discipline to do it, and there are people who do. Uh, so it leads me to think it's genetic. And uh, the longer I do this business, the more I realize it's genetic. You know, there are some people with rates, uh, you know, having risen, uh, you know, all the people that hated uh, oil energy stocks in 2000 are now value investors in uh, in first quarter of 2022 after all these stocks are up 300 to 400 percent. And they all look like barking ducks. I mean, it's the funniest thing to see is the, all these guys that love to buy breakouts and Momo stocks and get their faces ripped off in the last three, three months uh, are now value investors. And uh you know, they can put on the value investor shirt and, you know, put a sign on their lapel that says I'm now a value investor. But you just know that they don't have the experience. They don't have the training. They don't have the uh, interest uh, fundamentally to do it. They're doing it by necessity. And it is it's like a barking duck and it's silly to watch. Um, and, and it's fine. And they should just stick to their knitting. If they like to chase Momo stocks, they should chase Momo stocks. Uh, but um, uh I think it's I I think it's I think it's actually genetic temperament, and I think the audience that we attract over time, we weed out those people that are looking for the quick buck uh, to buy the greatest breakout, don't don't know what the company does, and are trying to catch a twenty percent move on a gap up in the morning, and you know 
uh, white knuckling every day, you know, staring at screens. That that's not our gig. And there there are people that make money doing that. There's not a ton of them, by the way, but there are some. Um, and um, uh, but they they don't have the g genetic attributes for this style, uh, just as we don't have the genetic attributes to uh, uh, you know chase squiggly lines on a screen on a 24 hour basis. So um, you know, plenty of ways to make money, but but this particular discipline is genetic. So if you've been listening for more than a couple of months, you probably have the gene. <laughs> Congratulations. So uh, there are, by the way. There are many people with this gene on the Forbes 400 or Centimillionaire. There aren't many, if, if not any, uh, Centimillionaires uh, uh, with, with, with the other gene. Um, so just keep that in mind. Patience pays, buying high quality when it's on, on discount, being patient, letting it build a base, dealing with the short-term headwinds and nonsensical overshoots on the downside before you're laying off to the excited people uh, on the up. Uh, overshoot on the upside it's just part of the game and it's I, I think it's genetic now I don't even know if it can be learned all right my friend sent this over to me love this uh thing from RBC um that's that's uh actually outside the thing here but it's RBC capital market so I want to give credit where credit's due Janet Engels and um okay so there are a few charts I want to cover number one here's the CPI it looks like it's peaking and rolling over so that's good uh, CPI and core CPI. We, we went through that. Next, the labor market's still hot. So they're saying that's not indicative of a recession. And they go through seven indicators that they say are still expansionary. We agree in the short term. We still think we're going to get a shallow recession next year at some point. Um, we may have already priced it in with the, you know, S&P, I think got down 17 or 18 percent uh, intraday at one point. So um, that may have already been priced in and we could be actually rallying in the face of the actual recession. But we'll see. Uh, I think that's a manana story in 2023. Uh, but what they point to is the yield curve 10 year to one year. Uh, that's useless, I think, as an indicator, but they, they put it there. Uh, unemployment claims, I agree. Unemployment rate, I agree. Very hard to have a recession with 3.6% unemployment. Uh, leading economic index, I agree. Conference board, free cash flow of non-financial corporate business. Okay, that's a, that's a good one. Uh, ISM, new orders minus inventories. That That is a jumpy number that bounces all around. So that's not, not as reliable. Fed funds versus nominal GDP growth. Okay, cool. So now Tom Garretson. Uh, okay, this is interesting. This shows the Bloomberg U.S. bond aggregate annual cumulative total returns for the past 30 years. The only time you saw the uh, bonds sell off so much um, in the beginning part of the year, which you know rarely happens, was 1994. 1994 was the same soft type landing where they raised rates, 75 bips, I think, uh, the market acted like crap, and then you extended the cycle for another five years. And I think we're there. And it's funny that the, that bonds turn the corner right in this early part of May, which is in line with the seasonality I showed you guys from treasuries after April, seasonally, we're strong through October, and now we're seeing it happen. Granted, it's only been a few days, but it's a pretty damn big move from 319 down to 282 in a few days. Pretty exciting that this is matching up to, to 1994 because that's kind of where our thinking has been, as you guys know. Uh, how far will the Fed have to rate hikes? I think, like I said, I think it's going to be 175 to 2 max and 270, 250 is already priced in. So that you're going to get the dovish pivot and that's going to be really good. Now, this, I guess this is Ray Slumer. Slu Slumer. Slumer. All right. Anyway. Um, this I've covered, uh, two years ago, I did an article about this when everyone was so bearish in here that we were going to go crash down like 2000. Uh, that was the last time they were calling for the 2000 crash. I said that this is just getting started. We're part of a secular bull. We just broke out in 2015 and these things last 16, 16, 18 years of consolidation, 16 to 18 years of upside, 16, 18 years of insolid consolidation. 16 18 years of upside and here we are right now um uh we're about uh this cycle is about set to go to 2034. now the key thing about that 17 year cycle is that if you look for it's like oh that's cute squiggly lines on a chart again i thought you weren't into squiggly lines on a chart well what's if you get the data behind this you can tie this to the P 
pig in the python in terms of demography. So at the beginning of all these monster uh, uh, 17-year bull runs, you had a large segment of the population starting housing formation in their late 20s and early 30s. They were the fattest part of the population. And the next 20 years during their peak earning and peak spending years is when you had this monster bull market uh, in, the re in, in, in stocks. And then you had a population drop and you went sideways for 17 years. Then you had an echo boom. You had one of the biggest bull markets in history uh, through 2020. Then you had my generation, which was only 65 million after 80 million. And what happened? For 15 years, the market did nothing. You had deflation. It was terrible. Uh, and now you've got 72 million millennials, uh, average age 31, starting housing formation a little later. And that's why we've been moving since 2015. Uh, and we're probably going to go through 2034 uh, uh, would be a reasonable expectation. It doesn't mean you don't get 30% corrections on the way up. You had it in 1987. You had a lot of volatility in the early 90s. You had a horrible year in 94 in the first part, which we just covered. And then your biggest five-year rally ever. Uh, you had it in the 50s. You had a couple of these big sell-offs of 30%. But the trend for the 17 years, and that's why you need to be patient. And that's why you need to be not on margin. So you can just ride through whatever is going to be thrown our way or if it's done and now we're going to start to rip higher. I, I don't know for certain. I know probabilities. But it doesn't really matter if you're thinking with this in this scheme of things. You're going to make a lot of money if you can just hold tight through uh, the 2030s and, and ride this wave of the millennials in our view. Um, I'd like to see that. Uh, what else did he cover? That was useful. Uh, you know, just 10-year yield peaking out, two-year yield peaking out. Dollar maybe, maybe topping. We'll see. Um, we know the commercials feel that way. So they're, you know, usually a few months early. Uh, that would be nice to see. That would be very positive for earnings. And then he just goes through the history of corrections and kind of says, you know, looking at sentiment, we're near a buy versus a sell. We've covered all that stuff. Consumer sentiment is abysmal. It can only go up from here. CPI, if that's peaking, that's going to help. Consumer sentiment and CPI are attached at the hips. All the corrections uh, since 1980 and the reason to stay in the market, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, thanks for that. Very useful. Let's look at the uh, short-term indicators just to give us a barometer of where we're at. 10-day um, uh, put call. This is where you want to be a buyer. You know, buyer, buyer. And again, like, you know, you could say, well, this time is different and maybe you'll be right. But, um, you know, nine... 90, 98 out of 100 times, if you're net buying when things are this oversold, you're going to win over the next 6 to 12 months in a major way. Um, this is the National Association of Active Investment Manager updated down to 25%. Scared out of their minds. They're at the lowest weighting since the bottom of the pandemic. That Was that a time to buy or sell? Well, if you remember from our March 19th article, which was one day before the bottom when we said it's time to buy, uh, we think it's time. We think it's time to buy specific things that are going to benefit from these lower rates. PMO buy all. It's still down at zero. Was at zero last week. But if you're buying at these levels, you're generally winning over and over and over and over and over. So um, uh, even the the Dow has come down now to a buy level. That was kind of the laggard. SPY, S and P 500. The bottom fisher indicator is down to where you want to buy. Like there's no indicator that's saying uh, maybe wait to buy. Every one of them is saying um, it's probably time to consider. Even the consumer staple index, this goes up because staples go up when the market corrects. This is at a high. This is going to roll over. Money's going to come out of staples and back into risk. Um, and bullish percent S&P back down to pandemic levels. Um, uh, McClellan Oscillator finally came down. Uh, NASDAQ McClellan Oscillator is down. So, you know, you could be scared or you can play probabilities and uh, we choose to do the latter. Sometimes, you know, it hurts for a couple of weeks uh, and then we make bank. So uh, it's just the way we do it. And it's, you know, it's genetic. At this point, I'm convinced it's genetic. After meeting so many people, you either have it or you don't. And if you're listening to this call, you probably have it if you've been with me for a few months. Uh, so God bless. You know, you were you were blessed. Uh, David Tepper covered his NASDAQ short earlier this week. So he missed it by a day or two. You know, God bless. He's one of the best ever in history. Owns the uh, South Carolina 
Panthers, and um, he's got that gene, by the way, and he's on the Forbes 400 list. So, um, so he's he's uh, um, got his uh, bearish exposure off. Um, Jason Gopfert says today, this is uh, Thursday, more than 29% of issues on the NYSE have hit a 52 week low on the NASDAQ. It's more than 33%. There have only been 18 similar days since 1984. The S&P showed a loss a year later, just once out of those 18 times or negative two tenths of a percent of the time. It's median return uh, for the remaining 17 times was 32%. A, a year later. So uh, every time you had the NYSE and NASDAQ percent of issues at a 52 week low of this magnitude, the median return 17 out of 18 times, 12 months later was plus 32% off the lows. And I think that's a reasonable expectation based on the current climate. Um, Goldman's Oppenheimer sees value in $11 trillion stock route. Uh, okay, I, I really, you know, Showing me an RSI indicator as as the basis for that is cute, but you know, okay. Um, let's get to some more stuff here. Uh, Goldman Tatsias calls peak inflation as firm trims core forecast. That's valuable, and that is kind of part of the premise because if if it's peak inflation, yields come down. If yields come down, biotech, China tech, value tech go back through the roof. And that's what we're excited about. I'm not positive about innovation tech. I'm not positive that the companies that were at 40 times sales that are now at 20 times sales and are down 80%. I don't know if they get bid. They probably get bid because risk will be on. But um, I wouldn't I wouldn't take that gamble. I, I don't think there's enough margin of safety. Kalanovic's out again bullish. So he's been a few weeks early. Uh, but he's often he's right more often than he's wrong. And you got to give him credit over the long term. And uh, Paulson... For those of you calling for uh, the 2020 crash that never ends, read Jim Paulson's article. He's one of the best strategists on the street, and he compares multiple by multiple, bearish argument by bearish argument, and tells you, just shows you how the similarities are not there, and um, uh, the multiples are nowhere in the same. And I think the most important thing that no one's talking about, which I talked about today, is the fact that the cost of capital was 6.82%, and inflation was running well below then. So there was a real cost of capital that impacts margin leverage, that impacts refinancing, that impacts weighted cost of capital. When you're making no money and you're paying 12% for that burn, it's a lot different story than when you're making no money and you're paying 2% for that burn. So um, it has a completely different impact. Uh, and um, uh, definitely check that out in the Financial Times. It's posted on the website. And I think this one's free even if you don't have a subscription. The title is, Is the Beg... Is the big tech crash already over? Uh, so he was a week early too, um, but he's right more often than he's wrong. Used car prices are crashing at a near record pace. If you remember, the two key components for inflation dry on the way up were energy and used car prices. Used car prices are rolling over. XBO Logistics beats estimates, raised guidance. That's a, that's a good barometer for the general health of the economy, like FedEx, like UPS. Um, this is Kalanovic again, out bullish get into stock. So he's a few weeks early at the end of the world. Global Foundries crushes earnings target on better than expected sales. This is a big deal because this is the semiconductor business, huge fab. They supply to all the semiconductors and uh, and they're they're hitting on all cylinders. I think what's a, what's a shortage right now is going to be a glut uh, in 18 months. That's, that's my bet uh, if it takes 24 months. And some of the auto suppliers that I've been emphasizing are trading like we're not going to have semiconductors for the next three years. So why I was on the phone with one of the companies that we're invested in and I said, so why are the OEMs like GM, Ford uh, trading so great if they have no semiconductors and you guys trade like crap? And the answer was uh, because the limited inventory that they have they've marked up so much that their margins are huge even though they've got all this because they've got all this pent-up demand once the semiconductors come in um they are going to start flying out the door because they have wait lists eight and 12 months you know four cars and that's going to go on 
uh, you know, dealer inventories are at like historic lows. So first they got to refill the inventories. Then they got to meet all the back back orders. Then they got to get to a normalized business. So even if we hit a strong recession next year, which I don't think we are, I think it's going to be a weak recession. Um, these things are going to fly. So uh, with Shanghai opening, with some of the semiconductors, I, I think this is going to happen a lot quicker than everyone expects. And based on the level of pessimism right now about everything and anything, I think things are going to start to break to a side that no one expects and no one's positioned for. Uh, and that's just usually how it works. And that's how it's worked for every cycle I've been through. Uh, Bank of America credit card spending data, April 2022. Total credit and debit card spending was up 13% year on year in April compared with to 11% in March. Last I checked, that's accelerating, not slowing. This is from Seth Golden at uh, Twitter. Uh, and he puts the note here. So that was really good. Uh, Liz Young from um, um, SoFi, uh, only 16% of NASDAQ stocks are trading above their 200-day moving average, getting close to levels of prior market bottoms, 2002, 2009, 2018, 2020. Still won't call it, but if you like watching these indicators, here we are. So, uh, And that was uh, May 10th. So that was three days ago. We're probably there now. Um, and the indicate we already went through a bunch of indicators that basically say the same thing. Uh, this is interesting uh, from a guy named Lance Roberts. The set market sell off currently in line with historical norms following the first Fed rate hike. Market generally finds a bottom one to two months following the initial increase, which was March, March, April, May. Okay, even I can do that math. Uh, and this is the um, all the previous first rate hikes um in the background here 94 by the way that's interesting it looks like 1994 again uh which which implies you know as powell said softish landing which could lead to a five-year monster run um in 1999 2004 2016 2022 and you see that they all kind of roll over this is uh and then one to two months later, you get this bottom, which is where we're at right now. And then you get a rip higher into the end of the year. So let's let's see if that happens. Um, okay, moving right along. Uh, again, from Seth Golden, for the Fangham stocks, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Google, Microsoft, valuations have been reduced. The PEs for this group are now 29% lower than their five-year average. And rates are still lower than their five-year average. And the multiple is down 30%. This is an overshoot in my view. And the thing, the catalyst that had to change was the 10-year yield had to get back below three. And now it's got to stay there. So that's the key. Will it stay there? And if it does, then all of our ideas are going to take off uh, very, very quickly. And that'll be exciting. So um, next, we did that. Next, here's an article from Counterpoint. Global semiconductor shortage likely to ease significantly in the second half of 2022, despite the China lockdowns. Okay, so this is worth reading. Uh, and they go through all the reasons why. Uh, even Zero Hedge, the bearish blog, S&P most oversold since March 13, 2020, when Powell announced he was buying anything not nailed down. It actually wasn't uh, the 13th. It was the 23rd. But um, anyway, the point is we're oversold and we, we've been saying that and I think the markets uh, may be starting to recognize. Uh, here's the PPI print chart that I showed you that I was talking about. Uh, uh, last week, last month was the peak, but I think, does this go back? Uh, yeah, so this would be, January, February, March, April, May. So you can see, here's what I'm talking about with base effects. Look at this huge spike in May of last year. And these are the comps that we're coming up on, which is going to make it harder and harder, which means these are going to roll over year on year in a material, material way. So the, so, so this is what we've been dealing with. And that's why we've been getting screwed on the inflation numbers when they were so low. Now that they've been spiking up and this is the next one, it's just the comps are going to get harder and harder, which means year-on-year year inflation is going to be lower and lower, well below 8.3, uh, 8 point, whatever it was last month, 8.9, and then 8, 8 9.6 last month, and 8.8 .8 this month, and then we're going to start to see 7.5, and this is going to roll over like a bell curve because these comps are so high. So that's what I'm trying, so that's a good visual. 
Uh, Scott Wabner put this out. I thought it was interesting. Lee Cooperman, who I uh, admire quite a bit, respect what he has to say, um, uh, was on Scott Wapner's show saying that you'll know when the bottom's in when uh, companies report horrible earnings, they sell off huge, and then they close the day flat or in the green. And I think, um, oddly enough, maybe the Beyond Meat was a sign of that as well. Uh, that uh, that um, um, that that was pointed out in the Bansari Kamdar pointed out in the Reuters article that I quoted, and uh, uh, Joe Terranova pointed out that Roblox did that the next day after Lee Cooperman spoke. It had like a twenty percent sell off, and then it closed, uh, I think, flat or positive, and I think it, I think it probably had some follow through today as well. So. Um, so this is Ellen Chang's uh, handle at Twitter. She wrote the great biotech articles. You definitely want to read that. And then here's a great article by, oh, okay. So this was the catalyst that I was talking about. Pfizer acquiring Biohaven Pharmaceutical for $11.6 billion. They've got a migraine drug. This is going to bring the game back on. This was at almost 100% premium. And, uh, and that's when it's going to get um, a biotech pop and is more of these type of deal. And this was the article by Kristen Flanagan, who was nice enough to call me today. I asked her about the math behind um, that chart that showed the, the spike in companies trading at a discount to cash. And um, and she was nice enough to call me um, so basically what she was saying here is that uh, okay it's down 55 percent from its february 2021 peak um nearly 200 such north american based companies have negative enterprise values meaning that their liquid assets, i.e. their cash and short-term investments, are worth more than their market values according to the data compiled by Bloomberg and also the data compiled by Adam Dyer, who put this together. So he ran the IBB, and he ran the XBI, and the XBI was correct. They said about 20%, whereas previous spikes had been about 10%. Adam got specifically to 16.56% of companies are now, uh, their enterprise value when you back out the cash is less than their uh, cash and short-term investments. And then he goes through uh, and he um, sorts by, uh, so you can see, each of them and what you find is the by and large the ones that are trading at a discount so there's the enterprise value itos the cash and short-term equivalents 848 million negative enterprise value then you've got like dmtk 18 million enterprise value 145 million of cash uh srrk 28 million enterprise value 212 million of cash so um so you'll see a lot of them are cheap as heck, uh, obviously you have to go through them and look at their burn and all of that stuff. But he asked a question. Um, if the weighting of the enterprise value below stock, cash and stocks in the IBB and XBI, would it be better to create your own index of those specific stocks instead of buying the entire index? Um, of course, those businesses have the most issues associated with them, but it seems like the reward would be skewed in their favor. For example, not thrilled about buying IBB with Amgen trading at 24 times enterprise value to cash while being weighted at 10% of the index. Perhaps this is relevant as your thesis is based around the fact that biotech sector as a whole historically stands to benefit from a rising rate environment. Okay, so two things. One, it's not that it benefits from a rising rate environment. It's that it can appreciate in a rising rate environment. So most people are saying that in a rising rate environment, 
no tech can work, no biotech can work, no emerging markets can work. But when you actually look back and during that tightening period as well, China tech did exceptionally well. Biotech did exceptionally well. They actually have a reasonably high correlation. So it's feast or famine. Um, now, you already answered your own question in that, you know, a lot of these smaller cap companies, you know, some of these are going to be 10 baggers. And there might be something to be said for what, what you were talking about. But that's why we've specifically kind of skewed towards the NASDAQ uh, because it has more of these companies uh, and the XBI that can do what we want them to do with the security of still having some of the bigger companies um, uh, with lower weights. And, and this is more of an equal weighted type of thing versus the IBB being cap weighted. Uh, so you wind up with the most expensive companies having the highest weight, whereas the XBI, you get a little less of that. And that's why during the last tightening cycle, it was up 140% off the lows. So um, this is great work. It it's confirms the thesis that uh, this many companies are trading uh, at a discount to their liquidation value and thereby um, shows that in those last four spikes, uh, they all work back up to new highs in a reasonable amount of time, even if they took five, six, seven months, nine months to bottom. If you just stuck it through, you got paid in spades. Uh, so great work there from Adam Dyer and uh, appreciate that very much as I'm sure the whole listening audience does. So this will ignite animal spirits. Let's see here. Uh, I think now we're on to China. Chinese companies boost returns to shareholders. Alibaba and Yum China are among the companies earmarking large sums for more repurchases. That was out this week. Uh, so, you know, here's the thing that I always explain when reporters call me and ask me, do you still own Alibaba? It's very simple, okay? China is the second largest economy in the world. They have been pumping the economy with stimulus, liquidity, and rolling back regulations since November. The problem with that is, is while they've got one foot firmly uh, pedal to the metal on the gas, they have the other foot, the left foot, firmly on the brake. Uh, and the, the company is spinning the back tires, burning smoke, waiting for the green light to go off so it can just smoke them down the quarter mile strip. And uh, we may be near that. If that was a true indicator of whichever handbag company that was, Coach or Kate Spade or one of those. Oh, it's, the, it's called Tapestry now. That, that's why I couldn't think of it. Uh, they were up today. The retail group was up today on, on rumors that they're going to reopen in June. This thing is going to rip roar and we're positioned for it. So um, so these additional buybacks they've already done, you know, we're only a third of the way through the year. They're more than half of the buybacks that they did last year. Uh, and um, and that's that. China promises a regulatory reprieve for its tech sector. You know, more of the same stuff. But until they open the doors, it's not going to matter. You can, you know, be burning the hell out of the rubber of the tires at the starting line, but until that foot comes off the brake and they reopen the economy, none of that liquidity, stimulus, fiscal and monetary easing is going to take effect. Um, this was the uh, spike chart again, hat tip to Tiho for uh, originally sending that over. Um, there's the buybacks. Lee Auto beats sales and earnings estimates. It's uh, relief in the stock is rising. That was really positive to see. It shows that despite all the headwinds over there, the consumer is there. And then today, this was a shocking article. Jack Ma makes rare public appearance at Alibaba Hangzhou campus to discuss philanthropy and agriculture tech. There's no way this visit happened without the government's blessing. And there you can see him. There's, you know, this is the South China Morning Post, by the way. There's no way this picture would be highlighted here with Jack Ma sitting right here with all these young uh, people sitting around, you know, talking with their hero, uh, the founder of Alibaba. This is a positive sign. It's basically saying uh, the tech uh, unwind is real. This guy can come out of his cave and uh, we're off to the races. Once we reopen the economy, all the things that they're promising to do are actually going to get done. And it's going to be just in time for what? Not to make Tom Hayes in America happy, but to make Xi Jinping have a um, uh, frictionless transition to his third term in office, like every politician around the world's number one job is what? To get re-elected. So uh, next, China's top mutual funds welcome unlimited investments. 
as their star managers expect to strike gold in the declining market. So they've removed their daily cap on subscriptions. Three funds have returned at least 20% so far this year, while the Shanghai Composites lost 17%. <clears throat> and they're all basically saying, you know, opportunity of a lifetime to buy this stuff. We agree. Uh, China Securities Regulator pledges action to shore up region's worst performing stock market, says route is an overreaction. Measures include encouraging more tech companies to go public and adding more stocks to the exchange link with Hong Kong. Vice Chairman of China's Regulatory Commission seeks to soothe shattered nerves of investors. Uh, interview with Xinhua. You know, we've talked about all this stuff. More buybacks, more this and that. But again, keep putting the gas, keep putting the nitrous oxide. You got to take your foot off the brake for this thing to win the race. And it can win the race. U.S. Chinese regulators in talks for audit deal. This is from over the weekend. So no further announcement, but they're communicating. That should get done. Then Alibaba's CEO reassures employees amid co uh, economic and regulatory challenge. Chairman D uh, CEO Dan Zhang tells employees and their families to, quote, relax despite uncertainties in the international situation and the COVID pandemic. With strict pandemic lockdown measures weighing on the company's economic outlook, Beijing is looking to give internet platforms a bigger role to help the economy. The big are going to get bigger. First, they spit on them. Now they need their help. And it's going to be to our benefit. So uh, please relax. Despite all this, we're still developed. Despite all the uncertainties in the international situation, the COVID pandemic, we are still developing as a whole. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. Slew of new policies are being devised to support big tech firms with innovation and globalization. Economic Daily state-run newspaper said last week. State-run newspaper said last week. State-run newspaper said last week. Internet platform oper operators will be given a bigger role in upgrading China's manufacturing and agricultural sectors. Oh, Jack Ma was there to talk about agriculture. So now they're going to have another division that they're going to dominate and the big are going to get bigger. And in stimulating domestic consumption, they want to stimulate domestic consumption. And who's the biggest beneficiary of domestic consumption is Alibaba. So um, according to the report, uh, Alibaba will continue its globalization strategy despite political, geopolitical headwinds and pandemic pressures. Um, da, 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 da. And ah, he said, no matter how the market changes, we are still the same, Zhang said, uh, was quoted saying by, by the local media late post. Don't get carried away when the market is good. Don't sell yourself short when the market is bad. If he ever leaves Alibaba, I'm going to hire him as an analyst. <laughs> Problem is, I may not be able to afford him. But nonetheless, um, that is something else and uh and that right there he has the gene that we talked about at the beginning of this podcast video cast let me repeat that don't get carried away when the market's good and don't sell yourself short when the market is bad and that's the name of the game so he's basically saying don't shorten the hole and don't chase the breakout <laughs> so i guess he's done this a few times all right z jinping scrambles as china's economy stumbles all you got to do is take your foot off the brake pal uh, China, what is the daily number of confirmed cases? The daily number of confirmed cases is collapsing. This is from, uh, what's this from? I don't know, WHO? I don't know, some credible place. So anyway, it's collapsing. You see what happened last time on a smaller scale. Um, so we've, we've, we've collapsed 50% from, from the peak just in the last, it's literally the last three days, it's just falling off a cliff and, you know, another, another week or so. I guess that's why they're planning on June, it, probably a week later, it'll be down here. They want another couple of weeks to be comfortable. And then we're going to have all this flat line and rocket into the China National Congress. Hong Kong defends local, and by the way, no one can predict the future. So opinion, not advice, go to hedgefundtips.com, click on terms. Everyone knows that, but I guess it remain, needs to be said for some people. Hong Kong defends local dollar. <laughs> in first currency intervention in 18 months, the capital flows out in pursuit of higher yields. Now, by the way, podcast people, you are going to get cut off in less than a minute. Go to hedgefundtips.com. Scroll down until you see the video cast. You click on the YouTube video. Fast forward to minute 60. You will pick up exactly where you left off word for word, and you can get the last 15, 20 minutes. We had a lot to cover this week because a lot's happening, 
And you don't want to miss some of the stuff from the article of the week where we go into kind of the sentiment, what's causing the sell off and how we think it can can resolve. Um, OK, coronavirus. China's central bank lends support as Shanghai eyes reopening after COVID-19 cases dropped for the 15th straight day. Again, that's very good. You don't hear that in the news much. And here we go with the article of the week. The forced seller stock market and sentiment results. This is more about structural dislocation than it is about multiples at this stage, given where rates are. So the selling we are seeing in recent days is not orderly or natural. It is forced selling from fund liquidations and margin calls. It will flush through the system and then we can find a bottom and start to recover. Maybe it was today. Maybe it'll be a week from now. We don't know. The only true defense in these type of environments is to own companies with a large enough margin of safety to weather it out until the sellers and margin clerks are done. You can't own stocks that have dropped from 40 times sales to 20 times sales, losing money and pray that there's a bottom. You have to own stocks with proven, historic and relatively predictable earnings power that are now trading at discounts to both the market multiple and their own historical multiple range. With that, you simply wait until the wind is done blowing and your business will rise first coming out of it. Very few recoveries are led by speculative high price stocks. They gain traction in the second phase of the move after the bargains have been snatched up. When the market behaves like this, there is no reason to look for why as correlations approach one, i.e. everyone, everything trades to the downside together. You need only wait, pull out your shopping list and begin to, the search for value. Many people pointed to the inflation report as the catalyst for yesterday's weakness. It was a mixed report. The bad news is inflation came in higher than expected. The good news is it came lower than last month, supporting the peak inflation narrative. Here's the rollover. Here's the base effects that we have to look forward to January, February, March, April. By the way, this is what we were competing against year on year. Next month, we go to this jump up. That's the big deal. And then this jump up. And then the comps are going to be impossible. Maybe, God forbid, we get some breakthrough on energy uh, we get a negative year on year by the end of the summer. That's probably a little too ambitious, but not out of the question. Look at these comps. Now, we're starting to see some positives in the report for the first time. Energy and used cars were the drivers on the way up. They'll also be the drivers on the way down. Look at the key number of key components down month on month. Compare that to previous months where there were rarely any negatives month on month. So look at all these negatives. Energy, energy commodities, and gasoline. Okay, month on month are all down, negative 2.7, negative 5.4, negative 6.1. Then you had used cars down another four tenths of a percent and apparel was down another eight tenths of a percent. That's five negatives in one month. We have not seen that. We had no negative, we had two negatives last month. The month before that we had one, two negatives. So, you know, it's going in the right direction despite all the pessimism. Now, on the bad side of the letter, ledger, consensus earnings came down $1 in the last week for the first time since December. You can see it here. While this is an unwelcome development, earnings are still holding above 10% growth for 2022. Considering the S&P peaked out at 4,800 last year, the market multiple would have to contract significantly from here to justify the current prices. Interest rates, although elevated, still do not support further multiple contraction from these levels. While we did spike up to 3.19% on the 10-year for a few minutes earlier this week, it is consistent with the peaks in October 2018 of 3.25% and January 2014 at 3.03% before receding aggressively. The five-year average multiple on the S&P 500, which includes the last tightening cycle, is 18.6 times. We're currently trading at seven, we traded down to 17 times uh, 2022 today and 15 and a half times 2023 today. Uh, could multiples go lower? Yes, but rates would have to go much higher to justify that magnitude of multiple contraction. Despite all of the pressure this week, one green shoot is the fact that bonds started to find a small bid this week and rates backed off. Uh, so you can see bonds getting bid, the yield rolling over. This actually fell a lot further today down to 282. So it's down here. It broke the head and shoulders top. Oh, it's going to collapse. So there you can watch that. The 10-year yield backed off to 292 at the close yesterday. When the dust settles and yields continue to stabilize at these levels, we will likely begin to see a move back into biotech, value tech, and China tech. Until then, we wait. But you know, now we're down at 282. If we can sustain down here, uh, we can get some relief. If you have purchased businesses and sectors trading at or below the low end of their normalized earnings multiple, 
There's nothing to panic over unless you're on margin. You just sit on your holdings, add at the margins if you want, and wait until the forced selling is completed. Just as prices overshoot sometimes aggressively to the downside, when things turn and they begin to rally back to intrinsic value, they will overshoot on the upside as well. The secret in this business is not to get shaken out on the downside overshoot when you, own, when you own historically inexpensive businesses and sectors and don't sell too soon on the upside when things begin to revert back to the mean. Recognize that reversion will not be from low end of the range multiples to average multiples. Reversion will overshoot as aggressively in euphoria to the high multiple as it did on the downside in despondency on the ridiculously low multiple. The key is to have staying power and know what you own. If you don't have confidence in the future earning power of the businesses you own, you are likely in a quote story stock that is long on promises and short on profits. We talked about that a lot last year and look what happened. So <clears throat> then you're just hoping and praying versus having confidence in the underlying asset. If you're in businesses and sectors trading below the lowest end of their historic ranges and have demonstrated predictable historic earnings power, your only unease will come from not having more capital to add or finding stocks that are up so you can use to add to your best ideas that are down, which we've done over the last few months with energy, selling them when they're up to fund the things that are down that are going to be the next things that are up a year from now. All these guys that will be China experts and will be laying it off and everyone will be calling me about China like they were calling me about energy in the last few months and I'm saying I'm, you know I'm basically out of energy you know, the time to call me about energy was in 2020 when we were when we were pounding the table and the same thing's going to happen with China same thing's going to happen with biotech in two years everyone's going to be a biotech bull and uh, and we'll be out of it and the same thing with China tech so beyond those two scenarios the only panacea is patience biding your time sitting on your hands and waiting for the four sellers who had too much margin to be liquidated so the market can clear and revert back to normalized valuations. Don't get me wrong, there's a large, large group of recent IPOs, SPACs, and story stocks that will never recover or return to new highs. Others will take many years. But if you're reading this, you're likely not the type of investor who buys momentum stocks. You, like us, buy quality when it's on sale and don't use margin. Therefore, you, only, you need only sit on your hands and wait. Time arbitrage heals all when you own a basket of high quality businesses with historic earnings power at low multiples. Your best strategy is likely to go play golf and wait for time arbitrage to heal all wounds. Uh, I came out of the gate last night with a par, by the way, so that, that's good after not playing for 20-something years, uh, second round. So, uh, yeah, I, I won't say there were many, too many pars after that, but I had a good time and, uh, and, and, and hit the ball quite well. No short game, but uh, it'll come back. If it does not, you got caught in the hype of easy money and you're... Okay. So uh, if it makes sense, to, if this makes sense to you, then you own the right businesses and sectors. If it does not make sense to you, you got caught in the hype of easy money and are paying your market tuition. Everyone goes through that process and pays the piper in their first cycle or two. After the tuition is paid, you always make sure, number one, you stay off leverage, and number two, you buy high quality when it's on sale. We've made no material changes to our portfolio beyond bulking up on a special situations auto parts supplier as the market has served up the opportunity in recent days. Mr. Market is in his manic mood and we must take advantage when the window is open knowing the market could go lower, but the underlying earnings power of our businesses is steadfast over time. Those are the type of businesses that enable you to live by the wise words of Rudyard Kipling. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too. Yours is the earth and everything, everything that's in it. And which is more, you'll be a man, my son. And if, in fact, we are at peak inflation in yields, which may now be the case, that reversion may be coming sooner than, than later. So enjoy the golf and waiting time while it lasts because the game will be back on before you know it. On Friday, we joined Marcel Munch from Germany of East West Investment Opportunities for an interview about our latest thoughts on the market, China, Alibaba, and biotech. It must have struck a chord because it went viral on YouTube and Twitter over the weekend. This is a good watch for those with interest in those areas. Um, if you don't have interest in those areas, I can't imagine how you've watched me for the last, you know, handful of uh, sessions. But uh, in this week's AAI sentiment survey result, bullish percent retreated to 24.3. This week from 26.9. Last week, bearish percent declined to 49 from 52. Retail sentiment is still fearful. Uh, fear and greed got down to 19. That's extreme fear. That's where you want to be a buyer, not a seller. And this uh, National Association of Active Investment Managers collapsed down to 25, the lowest level since the bottom of the pandemic. 
Uh, so uh, that's all you need to know here. 25, you can see it across the board. And then just looking at, um, ah, okay. So, you know, here are some of these story stocks, though, that actually are getting at levels and they have a moat that's kind of interesting. Darakaj Rashahi, the CEO of Uber, bought 200,000 shares at $26 and spent $5.3 million to buy his own stock. Uh, that uh, sends a pretty interesting signal um, about that business, which um, may be worth a look. Um, okay, Russell 2000. So Carter put this together. I had him check it five times last night. Um, and this is pretty exciting because the top 30 weights of the Russell 2000, which is the small cap index, their estimates, uh, the cumulative 2022 earnings power of these 30 stocks, the top 30 weights in the small cap index, increased by 14% in the last 60 days. So while everyone's doom and gloom, these businesses are estimates are going up dramatically. Uh, that's pretty exciting because this is the risk on segment. These are the biotechs of the world, small caps. So pretty, pretty interesting green shoots starting to show up despite all the chaos that appears to be happening. Uh, some key economic, we went through the, the key stuff was the CPI and the PPI. CPI actually came in less than expected. Uh, jobless claims are up a little bit. Um, so that's that's to be expected. Um, and that's really the story. What did we do on crude? We actually had a build of 8.5 million barrels. Let's see if that persists. That could be very constructive. It's kind of interesting going into driving season with that level of build. Um, so that's that. And I think that's it for this week. So um, went through a lot of great stuff. Hope you found it helpful through this uh, volatile period. This too shall pass. I think things are setting up nicely here. And with that said, we'll be back next week, same time, same place. Uh, thanks for listening in. In the meantime, make it a great one. Bye for now.